Welcome to the Happy Mama Movement Podcast. I'm Amy Taylor Kabaz, mama, journalist, coach, and founder of Mama Rising. This podcast is a space of community and collaboration. We gather stories of matrescence, motherhood, womanhood, and change told by our Mama Rising coaches and mothers around the globe in the knowing that through our stories, we can begin to heal and change the way the world sees, values, and supports mothers everywhere. So, welcome to the Happy Mama Movement. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. So often on this podcast, I speak to mamas around the world who reflect on what they wish they had had when they became a mother. Perhaps it's the birth or the postpartum support or the understanding and nourishing that they really needed as they entered into motherhood and matrescence. But today is really different. Today we're going to hear about a culture and a way of supporting new mothers that, to be honest, when I first heard it, I longed for this for myself 17 years ago. You're about to hear my conversation with Shraddha Biyani. She is of Indian descent, now living in Singapore and a mama of two. She's also an editor, a book writing coach and founder of Tashi Press. She trained as a journalist but also has a master's degree in urban planning from Harvard University and is now a writer, coach for other book writers and editor for some of the biggest publishing houses in the world. But why I asked her to be on the podcast today is because her experience of growing up surrounded by women and family in India and how they rallied around her when she became a new mama eight years ago was truly an insight into how we can all be doing it better. I hope you get as much out of this as I did. Enjoy. Radha, welcome to the podcast. I'm so looking forward to sharing this conversation with the mama community who listen around the world. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and speaking with you about my journey because I've been listening to your podcast for a while now and I find so many common themes in all the mamas that you have on your show and the struggles and the joys of motherhood that they talk about. So thank you for doing this for all of us. And uh, I'm very excited to speak to you today. Me too. It was an instant connection when we met a few months ago in Singapore when I was there for work. And we had an opportunity to have a chat at the end of a workshop that we were at together. And when I heard your story of especially postpartum support, I knew I wanted to get you on the podcast because, like I said in the introduction, so often the mothers on this podcast are reflecting on what they wish they had had. Now they know what matrescence is. Now they know what they really needed. But what I love about your story is that you're coming to it from a place of reflection and gratitude and um true support, a family support network around you. But to share that story, it goes back even further, doesn't it? It's almost we need to start about how you grew up in India. Yes, absolutely. I would, uh, you know, it is all a part, I think, of a very long story that started long before me. And um, I will not go back uh, centuries, but um, I think even if I just look at my life and how tall I stand on the shoulders of all the women who came before me in my family, my story is incomplete without acknowledging that, without acknowledging uh, their struggles and their support to women, to the daughters, uh, to the daughters-in-law who 
come into the family after them and who just have the privilege of building on what they have already built. And um, oh, what a beautiful way to begin! Thank you. Wow. Yeah, and um, so I grew up uh, in the late eighties and nineties in a small town in India in a big, large family home. Um, what we call a joint family in India. It is a lot of, you know, my aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, all of us living together in one home. And um, India is a very patriarchal society. Things are changing now in our generation, but only for a very select few educated urban families and but i think what that patriarchy has done and this by no means is an endorsement for patriarchy we need to dismantle that and move away from it but what that did and i can only talk about my family here specifically is the network of women and the support that they had from other women in the family younger older it doesn't matter you know how close or how far your relationship stood but that has been immense. You knew from the day you're born that you could always count on the women in your family to be there for you, to feed you, to nourish you, to nurture you, to take on your tantrums, to cheer for you, to, you know, tend to you when you're ill and uh, to be at the finish line cheering for you at every milestone. And uh, so I have this memory of growing up in a home where my mom wasn't just, wasn't the only mother figure in my life. You know, my aunt who lived across the hall from us and she continues to be mother-like for me even now. I grew up with aunts around me who were there to help me navigate the difficult teenage years when my mom and I would often be at loggerheads. I had older cousins who I could confide in. Um, and, um, and I had grandmothers, you know, who I could run to when I needed something that, you know, my parents uh, refused to let me have. And uh, so it has been this pyramid of grandmas and moms and aunts and cousins and sisters, all of us together growing up and looking up to each wow. other. Wow. I love the way you describe it as a pyramid of women, of support, that you almost, like you said at the beginning, you stand on the shoulders of this pyramid of women that have built you and supported you and got you there. And, you know, I know a lot of the mothers listening who feel incredibly isolated and feel like they are doing this on their, their own, hearing that, it, it brings a sense of longing even within me, of a of a way of us supporting each other differently. It's incredibly inspiring. And I've heard in other interviews I've done over the years about ancient traditions or old ways of supporting mothers where, and I believe it's similar with the Indigenous Australian culture here in Australia, that sometimes it wasn't even clear which one was your mother. <laughs> There was so many of them around. Like, of course, you did know who your mother was, but the aunties and the sisters and the cousins and the grandmothers were all so intertwined with the child rearing that you never just felt like you had one mother. It was a community of mothers. Yes, absolutely. And, in fact, it is factually correct for my own mum who, till the age of nine, didn't know her mom, who her mother was, because she grew up with these two mother figures in the family. So her her older aunt, you know, so they, they were like eight kids growing up together. And, you know, one was called Ma and one was called Buddy Ma, which is like big mama. And till the age of eight or nine, I think she didn't know which one is her mother or, you know. So it was, it is factually correct in some communities. Um, it's incredible. It really is. And it's interesting to me that you acknowledge that India is still very much a patriarchal society in a lot of ways. And yet, 
I wonder, was there a level of respect and valuing of women in this role that more Western patriarchies don't have? So much in our Western patriarchal world, women's work is dismissed and not valued and not worthy. In India, when you were growing up, did you feel like the women's roles were respected more? Um, I would say it was respected more by other women in the family. Mm. You know, patriarchy is the same villain. It's the same monster <laughs> everywhere, right? But I think it was the other women who acknowledged and respected, let's say, what a new mom is going through. So when I had my first baby and I entered this cocoon of women around me where I honestly, I became a child again, where I wow. didn't have to decide anything for, we have a confinement period, the first 40 days after you give birth, the postpartum period, which is called Japa in the subcontinent or Sava Mahina, which translates as five uh, weeks. So that time you are free of any household chores. You are, you don't have to cook or clean or do laundry or anything in traditionally you weren't even allowed to leave your bedroom, but that has changed. Now I would go for walks because it is just, there's so much focus on healing at that time for new mothers and the baby of course everyone focuses on the baby but I found in my case that there was so much focus and attention on me by my mom and my sister and my aunts uh, that what is on my diet on my sleep on my healing after the delivery and it really I didn't have to decide what I'm going to eat. There is a special diet which is um, which has been formulated to help with milk supply, to heal with the delivery, to you know help your uterus contract again, and to help with bleeding. So you know there's a special diet. I didn't have to think what I'm going to have for breakfast, who's getting groceries. I was served food. I was you know. There was insistence that I must drink this cumin water. And, uh, you know, I really only had to feed the baby. I didn't have to bathe the baby. I didn't have to sleep it on so many uh, moments. And I had so much support from my partner who, again, I never thought that I will need to acknowledge it because, you know, this is his baby as well. Uh, but I realized later after talking to friends and cousins and other people, that not everyone has such an equally involved partner. So really, I I think that was honestly the easiest time for me, the mm -hmm. first couple of months. Gentle care. When you and, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. When you hear about the experience of mothers in America, Australia, other parts of the world where we are, I mean, especially if it's not your first baby, if it's your second or third baby, I think about my own experience. You know, I was walking my other kids to school, pushing a pram up a hill a week after giving birth. Like there was no stopping. I had to do the shopping. I had like that. There was nobody else. So that's what mm -hmm. I had to do. When you think about and hear about those experiences, what does it make you feel when you see how vastly different we support new mothers? I honestly feel that there has been a great loss in this whole parenting journey over the years. Having, living away from the family fold and this very hyper-nuclear, independent, urban living I think we have lost our community and it becomes especially highlighted in early parenthood. You know, we feel that around the year at different life stages. But I think especially early parenthood, whether it's your first kid or your second or your fourth, you know, you need so much support and so much love and so much 
you want someone to take care of you you need someone to take care of you um and uh, i think all of us had that a few hundred years ago and it is only in the last few decades i think that we have lost it in some cultures and communities and i honestly feel that i first of all i don't think i would have had the courage to have a second one have a second baby if my first motherhood journey wasn't as smooth and as easy as it was and despite all the help that one has raising babies is an all consuming task there is even if you know physically i was not doing very much but you know you go through this complete mental and emotional rearrangement which is permanent mm. um and uh, if i i would have been so lost and broken i feel if i didn't have someone to you know fall back on on someone to tell me in those early days this is what you need to do now and so i didn't have to think i didn't have to judge i didn't have to even question what i was being told and um and and i and i know it's rare i know i was very fortunate to have that and i'm very grateful for that gentle care i became very attached to it to that time in my I life bet. I bet yes yeah <laughs> Yeah. And I remember when we first met and I was talking to you about this and just marveling at what a beautiful example of how it should be for all of us. I think I then asked you how it's viewed if you then build a career as a mother as well in your culture and in your you know in this in the history of your of your country because like you've acknowledged it's still a patriarchy and the role of women is to be that village of supporting the family and yet when i look at your career and your bio you've had a phenomenal success you're obviously an editor and a book writing coach and the founder of your own publishing company but you've also got a masters degree in urban planning from Harvard University you have worked as um a publisher for huge publishing houses so this this um i guess this valuing and support of mothers how does that how do you balance that with ambition so i absolutely would not have been able to do it without the support of my family um and without the support of my partner but i have to also acknowledge the support the tremendous support that i've had from excellent child care around me mm-hmm. in mm. and in india it is affordable still in india and in singapore to have someone live with you to help you with your running your home with cooking with you know the fetching and dropping of kids to school and classes and there is absolutely no way i would have been able to do as much as i have without all of these various support systems that i also very happily tap into i am i like to believe that i'm an open hearted person i give easily but and i also receive easily i ask easily i ask for help you know when uh, my partner and i both need to travel or whenever i felt that i i can plan that you know next month i have something big coming up at work and i need support i i'll ask my mom if she's free to come and help us and that support while i need less and less of it as my kids are growing up but just knowing the fact that you know i have it when i need it i think that has just helped me reduce my mental load i listen to one of your earlier episodes where uh, you know you talk about the mental load and uh, for me just knowing that i have these support systems that i can tap into has really helped me um, you know reduce my mental emotional load and also i would say that you know while motherhood makes you softer and more vulnerable 
but at the same time it also makes you really strong and grounded and you know that if something needs to get done mama has to do it you know mm-hmm. so i procrastinate less i know i have this window to work when my kids are in school so i better make the most of it and uh, so yeah i've been really fortunate to have had that support the immense support in the early years but also this continued support as mm-hmm. my kids are going they still need me and when they are ill you know very often it's they need either their dad or me mama you know? first mm. yes we mm. often talk on the podcast about almost like the hyper independence of women um especially you know of our generation who really feel like asking for help is a sign of weakness and mm. then you hear what happens when you grow up surrounded by women helping each other and that there is no shame in everybody raising the child together and there's no shame in sharing the load between many different women no wonder it's then so much easier for you to receive help and ask for it because you've had that model right from the beginning whereas so many of us didn't see our mums asking for help either And so it really is this massive shift in trying to receive help like you beautifully said without feeling, you know, like we're failing, feeling guilty. That's what comes from having that village right from the beginning. I th- I think so. Having said that, you know, I see a slight difference in personality between my sister and me having grown up uh-huh. in the same family. um and i also have a younger brother and i feel like my brother and i are these people whenever we are faced with a problem um our first thought is who can i call you know who can help me with this and i think my sister who grew up with exactly the same set up the same village you know i think her personality is also a little bit can i first try to do it on my own and mm. of course she has all of us to count on uh, but yeah so i think it's a little bit of both so i think there is hope for people who did not grow up with this around them but if you know as adults now you know there is a chance to just open up a little bit and ask for help and i think in turn now i live in singapore away from my family but i hope my friends around here know that when they are ill when they need something they can count on me and you know mm. we have constant exchange of food between our homes and our in our condo and uh, you know we ask each other that can you look after my kid this saturday afternoon and i i love that i love to be able to give that and also receive that that was what i was going to ask you next was now you're raising your daughter and your son in singapore um without that huge family house of everyone in together how are you passing down the values of that support network um to your daughter and your son of course so that they know that they can always call on all of you when they need it mm, i think you know i'm hoping that you know just by example you know by being a good role model to them they see mm-hmm. me you know not struggling by myself they know i always ask for help and very often i ask them to help me when i need when i know they can support me or help me in certain ways and i think i became more conscious of this during covid because i moved to singapore during covid and the first year was very very difficult because i came from that cocoon of safety and security and loved ones around me to a place where we weren't allowed to meet our neighbors because of you know that time that extraordinary time and to a place where i didn't know anyone and it was hard to meet people and make friends and i think it was in that time that reflection that really made me value what i have because growing up with it i just took it for granted that oh this is what everyone has this is how everyone lives and you know i of course 
as I hear stories from friends in other countries, I realize how even my motherhood journey has been very special and not everyone has it. But, um, you know, I'm hoping being in Singapore now where I have a really good, strong network of friends and I love having family over. I'm always badgering them to book their tickets for the next trip to see us and that my kids will learn and value the relationships that we are fortunate to have in our life. Yes, what I've really got out of our conversation is obviously not all of us have that family unit around us, the extended family we can draw on or call on, but we can all in our own way almost redefine what support looks like and what that village looks like, whether it's your neighbours, whether it's the school mums. Um, you know, so many of us live away from our families nowadays and so we do have to make our own community. Um, my daughter, my nearly 15-year-old, said to me just the other day, oh, Mama, you've really finally got your people here in Sydney. It took me a long time because I had little kids and I was working full time to really build this network that is everything from the paid support like doctors and, you know, therapists and massages and, you know, everything that we have there. Like I've got all my good people. And over on my friend's side, like I've really found my network now. And I honestly just reflected this week because she pointed it out to me just this week. How, what a difference that has made to me feeling like I can do this in Sydney on my own. I now really have this network around me. So we can all do this to a certain extent. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, the quality of our life is really a reflection of the quality of our relationships. And, mm -hmm. you know, one born with all the relationships, but if you don't work hard on them, you know, then they don't amount to much. And there's always time to find your people and to build new relationships and continue to work hard on them. And when I had my first daughter, my mother shared a fairly common Indian wisdom with me that motherhood is rebirth. And that was, a, and I think in that moment, it's hard to kind of grasp that idea completely because I think what babies also tend to do is that they drown out a lot of the noise of the world outside. And you focus on the simplest concerns of food and sleep. And it is only a little bit later in the parenting journey when you are getting the full night's sleep and when you have time to enjoy your coffee in peace is when <laughs> you can see and understand that whole idea of rebirth and be happy to embrace this new life. And uh, I know a lot of us do that. You know, there is there are things we used to do pre-kids and there are things we do post-kids, right? That that is the watershed moment in uh, a parent's life, and uh, in this new life, more than any other time, is when we need these relationships and our networks to come alive and support us. And the best way I think to do that is to be that for someone else, is to support mm. other mums and new parents and non-parents around us. So. Mm. Oh, I wish that this wisdom was so much more common than it is. I really do hope that we come back to these understandings that motherhood is a rebirth, that for those first 40 days we really need to be nourished and nurtured and our, pers you know, our physical, emotional, mental healing needs to be prioritised rather than just get on with life and get back to who you used to be. There's so much beautiful wisdom, rituals and ideas in this um, that I hope we can bring back for so many more people. So thank you so much for talking with me today. I know you also are such an incredible book coach and editor and uh, there will be many people who are listening who have this book baby that they want <laughs> To be birthed as well so i will put your details in the show notes for anyone to reach out to you um, and you know get your support in that beautiful way as well 
Amy, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. And I think you're doing the all important work of amplifying this conversation and helping spread this wisdom far and wide. We all know it deep in our bones. We just need to hear it from someone sometimes. And thank mm. you for doing that for all of us in the community who are listening. And uh, I'm sure this Happy Mama movement is going to grow stronger and wider and yeah, change motherhood for a lot of mamas to be. Oh, thank you. Yes, that is my hope and prayer too. Thanks so much, beautiful. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, as always, for being a part of our global matrescence community. Please take a moment and make sure you're subscribed to this podcast in your podcast player so you can always be notified of our next episode. And if you would like to work with a coach on your own experience of matrescence, please go to mummarising.net and explore our directory of phenomenal coaches, workshop leaders, space holders and facilitators around the globe. You can also explore our Global Matrescence Foundation and consider donating so a mama in need can access the support of one of our coaches and still ensure that our coaches receive the income and support they need so they can continue to work in this way. And finally, if you would like to be a coach, a facilitator and a matrescence activist in your own community, jump on our wait list for our next intake of the Mama Rising Facilitator Training at mamarising.net. Thank you for being here and being part of this movement. Until next week, bye.